morning. Today we're going to talk about the second part of perfusion, um, and the three topics we're going to talk about are cardiomyopathy, aneurysm, and DIC. So first, cardiomyopathy. I mean, remember we're going to do the what is it, how do we treat it, and what do we teach them. Right. So first, what is cardiomyopathy? Basically, any type of cardiomyopathy is just a disease of the heart muscle, and it can be associated with cardiac dysfunction. It's usually classified to whatever structural or functional abnormalities that it causes in the heart. So you have three types. We have the dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive. Okay. So dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common. Um, and without, <coughs> excuse me, it's actually a cardiomyopathy without hypertrophy, meaning the muscle is not, um, not big. Okay. But it does cause an increased volume, but a lower ejection fraction. So the reason why it has a lower ejection fra uh, fraction is because of the size of the muscle. Let me pull you up here. So on the left, you have that increased atrial chamber, the increased ventricular chamber, and then the decreased muscle size. So now there's just too much space. So we have increased filling, but there's not enough pump. Okay, so a lot of volume, but we can't pump it out. I'll try to go back here. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. The second kind we have is hypertro or hypertrophic. Okay. So the hypertrophic one is super rare. It's usually genetic, um, typically discovered sometime after puberty. And if it's discovered at all, um, it's usually due to <laughs> sudden cardiac death. Okay. So these people, they don't know they have anything wrong. Um, and then it's like those athletes, they just like drop dead on the field. Okay. So that's hyper or hypertrophic. Um, cardiomyopathy. So in this one you have a really large heart muscle, but it's asymmetrical. So it increases in size and then it delays the relaxation of the muscle. So all of that leads to decreased filling. Okay, so I'm going to go back here. So in the middle picture you can see the hypertrophic. Okay, so it has that thick intraventricular septum. Okay, so that decreases our chambers and it doesn't allow for enough filling of the heart. But what happens is if that person gets super dehydrated, that septum will kind of collapse on itself, and that'll cause sudden cardiac death. Okay, so hypertrophic is extremely dangerous, um, and again, probably wouldn't even know you had it unless you had some kind of family history. Um, if our patients do have family history of this, we want to make sure that they get checked with an echo just to keep track of it and make sure that they don't have it or they don't develop it. Okay. So the last one we're going to talk about is that restrictive cardiomyopathy. So in restrictive, we have a diastolic dysfunction, and it's caused from super rigid ventricles. So this doesn't allow for filling or stretch of that muscle. Okay, so restrictive is the one on the right. And here we do have that hypertrophy of the muscle, okay? So it's grown really big, and now it's causing those chambers to be restricted. So we don't have enough um, fill. So all of these can actually lead to heart failure okay, if they are not treated. Um, and all three of these actually do cause uh, decreased stroke volume, and that would lead to increased systemic resistance and definitely an increased workload on the heart. Uh, and some electrolyte imbalances we're going to see with all three cardiomyopathies are going to be um, an increase in sodium, and definitely you're going to have some fluid retention. Okay, so that's that leading to that heart failure. So because we have that decreased output, it causes our kidneys to kind of hold on to as much sodium and fluid as they can. So who's at risk for these? Um, again, or hypertrophic is a genetic, but the other two can definitely be caused by alcohol, viral, med um, viral infections, and definitely medications. So some, some medications will cause especially that dilated cardiomyopathy. So our responsibility in this is we're going to maintain cardiac output, definitely educate. Um, we want to educate them on keeping track again of their cardiomyopathy so they're going to make sure that they go and get those echoes and do things that aren't so um, high demand for metabolism or your heart. Okay, So let's use the nursing process for this. So when we're assessing someone with cardiomyopathy, first we want to make sure that we get an appropriate family history. Okay. Um, you might see them with chest pain, 
They might have a different pulse pressure. They might have pulses paradoxus. They definitely will have some heart failure symptoms, okay, holding on to that fluid. And you might see some uh, murmurs with this. Some nursing diagnoses we can have, decreased cardiac output, decreased perfusion, and even some gas exchange problems. Because if we're having heart failure, now we might get into uh, some gas exchange. So our planning is definitely we want to increase activity tolerance, right? decrease their anxiety, and definitely educate. So that's going to be that planning and implementation. And then, of course, we can evaluate by having them go get their echo. All right. So our second topic are aneurysms. <coughs> Excuse me. So for aneurysms, there's actually two kinds. Okay. So we have the saccular and the fusiform. I want to see if I have a picture of this in the next one. Yep, I do. Okay, so you can see the one all the way in letter E. Okay, letter E is our saccular aneurysm. Okay. So this is that bulbous protrusion on one side of the vessel wall. Letter D is the fusiform. Okay, so that's nice and symmetrical, but the entire vessel has that nice kind of barrel form to it. Okay, so those are the really true aneurysms we have. Uh, a is the normal vessel. Okay, B is a false aneurysm, or we call them pseudoaneurysms. And that's usually like a, a hematoma on the side of the vessel wall. It might be just be like a clot outside of it. Um, C is another form of saccular aneurysm. D and E we already talked about. And F is a dissecting aneurysm. Okay, so this is that hematoma that's now splitting the layers of our ar arterial wall. Okay, so let's go back one. So those are the types. And people who are at high risk, um, usually people who have issues like arthrosclerosis, hypercholesteremia, um, hypertension, Right. All of these people are definitely at risk for getting an aneurysm. They can occur pretty much anywhere in the body. Um, we're going to talk about a few specific sites in this lecture. Okay, so, for example, abdominal, thoracic, um, but theoretically they can occur in any vessel. Okay. So our responsibility is we're assessing for signs and symptoms of rupture. Right, so if they come in and we know that they have a dissecting aneurysm, Typically, the treatment for that is just medications. So they're going to take medications for blood pressure. They're going to take medications for high cholesterol. Um, but once the aneurysm dissects to probably about five centimeters or more, that's when they start considering surgical um, removal of that aneurysm. Okay. So before they go into surgery or pre-op, we're going to assign, assess for signs and symptoms of rupture. So that could be uh, looking for chest pain, decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate. They might even have some back pain. And we're just going to look out for definitely um, putting them on a heart monitor, looking at pulmonary, looking for respirations. Okay. And we're also going to be checking renal okay, and neuro. So the reason we're going to look at renal and neuro is because we know that the renal likes all the blood flow and they control or the blood pressure. In neuro, we want to make sure that they're not throwing a clot anywhere. Okay, so people who have aneurysms are at high risk for getting strokes. Okay. After they go for surgery, we're going to check for possible complications of that surgery. So definitely signs and symptoms of infection in the surgical site. Um, they might end up with an arterial occlusion. They can even have hemorrhage. They could definitely have an ischemic bowel. Okay, so depending on how that aneurysm is removed, um, if they do an open triple A like an open abdominal aneurysm repair. That means they're actually opening the stomach and they clamp the aorta above and below that aneurysm. So all of that blood flow is now cut off. And so that could lead to like an ischemic bowel or even some renal dysfunction. Here's those pictures again that we already talked about. <coughs> so now specific types, all right, and what they might look like. Right. We have that thoracic aneurysm. Again, this is in the th thoracic aortic aneurysm, and that's in your thoracic cage in the aorta. So this is the most common site for dissection, and typically you're going to see a patient um, that has kind of like superficial veins, all those superficial veins in the chest. They're going to start to become dilated, and then they're going to cause like edematous and kind of bluish areas on the chest and neck. 
because there's all that pressure that's pushing up on those superficial veins. Right. In the abdominal aorta, um, usually this occurs in men more than women, and is definitely more common in Caucasians and older people. Um, but you guys know how to assess for that. We learned it back in nursing one, right? So looking at pulsating masses, right? if you see a pulsating mass, please don't touch it, right? Other aneurysms, again, you can have them in any artery. So they have popliteal, you can have uh, peripheral. It can occur in any type of vessel. And when we have a dissecting aorta, this is when our vessel begins to rupture. If it does rupture completely, that's usually dead disease for a patient. And again, risk factors for those aneurysms, genetics, tobacco, uh, but hypertension usually is that cause. Uh, so nursing process with this, the assessment of those patients, again, it's going to uh, vary depending on the size and, of course, the area in which you have that aneurysm. Right? So you might look for signs and symptoms of rupture, which could be that chest pain, back pain, um, bleeding. And some nursing diagnoses, you might have um, inadequate or too much fluid volume, have hemorrhage, decreased cardiac output, right? And our planning and implementation is definitely going to be um, looking at treatments basing on whether the patient's symptomatic. Okay, so if the aneurysm starts to dissect or if the dissection gets bigger, then we're going to want to think about surgical interventions rather than medical. Um, evaluation. Hopefully they won't go into shock or have any post-op injuries um, or any complications. All right. So finally, we have the disseminated intravascular coagulation, or as we like to call DIC. All right. When I was in nursing school, we learned that DIC meant death is coming. Right. This is a horrible, horrible um, secondary process that can happen in your patient. Right. So disseminated inter uh, intervascular coagulation, or DIC, is not a disease in itself. Okay? There's always an underlying condition that causes this. Number one reason, sepsis. Right? So it can be from sepsis, we can have trauma, uh, cancers, abruptio placentae, right? uh, toxins. Right? So there's lots and lots of different things that can lead to DIC, but sepsis is your number one cause. So this is basically when your coagulation is too good, <laughs> okay? So um, I'm going to explain it a little bit in the, in the next slide with our patho tree, but what happens with DIC is you get all kinds of little ischemic thrombi that start to form in a response to whatever condition is in that person's body. And then suddenly all of your platelets stop working, and then poof, you're bleeding everywhere. Um, people who do have DIC, they have a pretty much 80% mortality with this. Um, that's why we call it death is coming. So we kind of talked about who's at risk. Remember your septic patients, really bad. Leukemia is another common cause. Right. Um, and our responsibility is assess for signs and symptoms of increased thrombi by formation and bleeding. And the person's prognosis is really going to depend on our early recognition or if we're able to reverse the underlying cause, which sometimes we're not. So let's look at that patho tree. Okay. So this kind of explains it in a better form than I can in words, right? But you get that significant illness, right? You might have the trauma, sepsis or the trauma, and that's going to lead to our coagulation. Okay? So this is our normal body's response, uh, normal inflammatory response. So what happens is we get that fibrinolysis and we get that initial fibrinolysis, sorry, and it forms thrombuses, okay, and that causes all kinds of tiny microcirculations in the bloodstream. So then now our body is trying to unbreak these tiny clots. So all of these micro, uh, micro clots are just eating up all the platelets, okay? So you have tiny, tiny micro clots, all the platelets go to attack it, and then boom, they just stop working because now we've used up all our platelets. And this is going to lead to some bleeding Definitely, you're not getting perfusion to your tissues. You're going to have end organ damage and then finally failure and death. Okay, so again, we have that inflammatory response from an underlying disease. Okay, so that's going to initiate your infl um, inflammation and coagulation in all your vessels. So massive amounts of tiny clots 
Okay, so they're all over the body. And then finally our platelets and our clotting factors trying to work and then they have just massive failure and that leads to that paradoxical effect of bleeding. So these people might have tons of bleeding coming out of every orifice or they might have no bleeding at all. It might be all internal. Um, but when this happens, that, that person will most likely die. So in our nursing process, again, our assessment of that patient, you're going to see labs for most of this. Decreased platelets, um, so almost none. You're going to have an increase in PT and APTT. You might see the D-dimer, okay, so that's that um, lab that looks for thrombus formation. And again, bleeding could be minimal to hemorrhaging from everywhere. Our diagnoses with this, ineffective tissue perfusion, fluid volume, definitely acute pain, right? And planning and treating is going to just be treating that underlying cause and preventing that end organ damage. So we're going to be monitoring everything, right? So we're going to be on a heart monitor, looking at respirations, doing neuro checks, looking for signs of bleeding, hypovolemic shock, um, checking skin for bruising, okay? Any item or anything at all that would suggest that they're bleeding. And then we're also going to be looking for signs of PE, okay, so that pulmonary embolism, making sure they're not going into multi-organ dysfunction, um, and also fluid overload. Okay. So evaluation, honestly, the evaluation for DIC is hope they don't die, right? So we want to make sure they're free of complications. And that is all I have for the second part of perfusion.